Let's have fun constructing kernels from other kernels. Okay, so let's start with K1 and K2, which we assume are valid kernels. And as it turns out, a linear combination of them with positive coefficients is also a kernel. Okay, so how do we know this? Well, both K1 and K2 are valid kernels, so they both correspond to reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces with their own feature maps and inner products. And so, um, I can use the bilinearity of the inner product and also the fact that the alpha is non-negative to sort of send that alpha in and divide it between the two, the left and the right side there, same with beta. And then um, I can just, when I write k in terms of, you know, k1 and k2, I can just use those, use those two terms that I just created right there. Okay, so I can write, I can write k in terms of the feature maps from both of the two reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. So then that means that I can define a new um, inner, I can define a new inner product that leverages those reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. And now that forms a valid inner product because we know exactly what the feature map is. And since we know what the feature map is and that it's a, there's the feature map is valid, then that means that K is a valid inner product. Okay, now I'm gonna be doing a whole bunch of these rules and I decided it would be too much of a pain to kind of prove them all. So I'll just prove every other one, okay? So I'll like prove one, skip one, prove one, skip, skip one, that sort of thing. So I proved this one. So uh, anyway, I get, to, I, get to, I get to keep that one, then I prove that, and then I'm gonna skip this one. Okay, so as it turns out, the product of two kernels is also a valid kernel. Cool. Okay, the third one is that if you take a kernel of a transformation of both X and Z, then that actually is a kernel. Now this one is very easy to prove because you can think of H as like a pre-processing step. Like you take H and you take Z, take X, sorry, you take X and you take Z, you map them through H, and then you send them through phi for K1, for, for K1's um, reproducing kernel Hilbert space. Okay, so you think about it, um, you can write this, you can write K1 as just sending you through phi and then not only do you get sent through phi, but you get sent through h first. Okay, so you just kind of build h into phi and then call it your new uh, feature map. And so therefore, uh, you have a valid uh, feature map and therefore k, uh, th th therefore this new k1 of h, x, h, z, that is now an inner product. Okay, cool. Uh, which means k is an inner product. Now, as it turns out, that if you have a kernel function that's separable like this, where it's like, you know, a function of x times the same function of g, that actually is a valid kernel. And I won't prove that one, <laughs> but I'll prove the next one, which is that um, if you take a polynomial with positive coefficients of a, a known kernel, you get back a known kernel. Now the proof of this one requires us to just consider the fact that polynomials are where you multiply terms and you add terms. So if you just look at rule one and rule two that I showed you earlier, that if you add kernels together, you're good. And if you multiply kernels together, you're good. Well, a polynomial, like I said, it's just multiplying and adding stuff together. So you're good. Now, um, here's where it gets interesting. Uh, the, if you take the exponential of a kernel, that is still a valid kernel. And why is that? It's because the exponential is a limit of polynomial terms. And all of these terms are like, um, they all have positive coefficients. And so you get back still a kernel. Okay, um, so uh, if you want to think, if, if you have trouble with the notion of understanding limits, you can think about the Graham matrix and think about, you know, uh, the fact that every element in the Graham matrix is a limit of these polynomials. And so if the Graham matrix was positive uh, semi-definite, then the limit of it here um, is also going to be positive semi-definite. That, that helps me kind of be more comfortable with this idea of doing um, limits of limits of polynomials, which are valid kernels, kind of being a valid kernel. Okay. So the last one is the one we've all been waiting for, which is the Gaussian kernel. And in fact, I, it's, it's, 
all, all the work that we've sort of done up until this point, all of that really deep theory, all of it led up to this point where we can show that the Gaussian kernel is a valid kernel because that's the one that everybody wants to use. Okay, it's either linear polynomial or Gaussian, right? Okay, so the Gaussian kernel is, is indeed a valid kernel um, because you can take uh, what's inside the exponent, take that norm, you know, write it out, okay? So there's three terms. There's two terms there and a cross term. And then, because it's the exponential, I can split it up into these three separate actual things that are multiplying each other. Now, the first two of them get handled because of the fact that um, g of x times g of z is a valid kernel. And here we have, you know, g of x, some function g of x, and some function g of z, and so that is a valid kernel. And then we have to deal with that third term. So luckily for us, the exponential of a kernel is a kernel, and then how do we know the, the inside is a valid kernel? Well, it's just it's just the regular vanilla linear kernel x, you know, just a regular inner product of x and z, which is definitely an inner product. And it's just multiplied by a positive number, which is 2 over sigma squared. So that is a valid kernel. So this is the exponential of a valid kernel. Okay, now I have three kernels that are multiplied together. They are all valid. And so because the product of kernels is a, a kernel, we are all set. We have that the Gaussian kernel is a valid kernel. Okay, yeah, and so that uses rule number two. Now, um, the, the whole idea of the Gaussian kernel is exactly the kind of picture I was showing you earlier, where it's sort of like um, you take each point and you map it to a function centered at that point, and there's one argument missing, right? So you can fill in what that extra, that extra value of the argument is and get an actual number. Okay, cool. Now, the Gaussian kernels are really nice because they, if you think about what the... Um, what the model actually is, it's a, a, you know, a linear combination of the kernels centered at the xi's. And then the alphas are always non-negative. And y is positive for positive examples, and y is negative for negative examples. So for positive examples, you're going to get a positive bump on y, right? You're going to get a positive, sorry, positive bump on xi. And then if the example's negative, you're going to get a negative bump on the xi. Okay, because again, alpha is non-negative and y is either plus one or minus one depending on the label. And so you're adding up all these positive bumps on the positive examples and negative bumps on the negative examples, and you get something cool. Okay, so there's like, you know, a bunch of positive bumps and a bunch of negative bumps, and then you get a decision boundary that kind of runs in between it, okay? And that's, that's how Gaussian kernels construct their decision boundaries. All right, so just a few notes. Um, the width of the Gaussian kernel, which the user chooses in advance, actually does control, it's another control on regularization. So you have a regularization term, but the, the kernel itself is another control on regularization. If the kernel's too small, that means you have tiny little bumps on each data point and you're just memorizing the data, which is exactly overfitting. And if you have a kernel, that's, a kernel width that's too large, then everything gets just smoothed out and you lose all of the detail um, and then um, it's just underfitted and you're not gonna be able to fit the data really well. All right, so, so the way you set that kernel parameter is usually to tune it, to tune it using cross-validation or you could set it to the default value which is set nicely so that you don't, it, it generally performs well using the default and the default is just scaled based on sort of the knowledge of the data and how it's, you know, just the scaling of the data in the space. And um, you're probably wondering, well, which kernel should I use? And the answer is it's really not clear because you don't know in advance how you should model the data, right? You just know that the data come IID from some unknown distribution. You don't know anything about it. So you don't know whether a linear kernel, polynomial kernel, or Gaussian kernel is going to perform the best, or you could even design your own kernel if you like. Um, so usually people just try a few of them, <laughs> or you could do what I do and just go straight to Gaussian kernels because I like them. Up to you. So again, I just want to warn you that you should be aware of bad support vector machine solvers. I don't know why we still have bad SVM solvers given that 
this technique has been around for so, so long, um, but uh, there are good solvers out there. And then I should again warn you that you shouldn't expect it to work in higher dimensions because when you choose a kernel, you're choosing a distance metric between points, right? You can think of the Gaussian kernel, um, go back here, you can think of the Gaussian kernel as having, the, it has like the distance between xi and x and, and x in there, right? It's a, the norm of xi minus x, that's the distance between xi and x. So you're actually choosing the way you view the distance between xi and x. And so um, what that means is that uh, any distance metric, I mean, humans are not good at choosing distance metrics in their heads. And you're using the same distance metric no matter where the point is in the space. And so um, since that distance metric is not allowed to vary as you move around the space, then um, the, the method tends to, um, tends to uh, perform uh, poorly uh, sometimes in, in higher dimensions. It works until about, say, maybe like 15 dimensions or so. In any case, make sure you check out the next video because I'm doing a, a demo of Gaussian kernels and how cool they are and how flexible and interesting they are. Thank you.